Hey fun fans, our featured FRC deep dive team is 1619 Upper Creek Robotics, and they've hooked us up with a sweet 1619 t-shirt. To enter, be a YouTube subscriber and let us know in the comments which 1619 video is your favorite. You can enter in any video that has this intro, so make sure you comment below. We'd also like to thank our sponsor of this show, Stryker. Discover why so many FIRST alumni and mentors are putting Stryker first when it comes to their internships and careers. Visit striker.com forward slash first to view career openings tailored to those in first. That's S-T-R-Y-K-E-R dot com forward slash first. I mean, I, I drink probably more Diet Coke than almost any other human being alive, except for maybe John Daly, the golfer. I heard he drinks like 24 cans a day or something. Yeah, but yeah, yeah Diet love Diet Coke. Diet Coke's a really big thing on our team, especially for the mentors. Like every mentor, they come into the building and it's like, get your free Diet Coke of the day. It's just like a really consistent thing. It's just been a really big part of our team. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, speaking of times when everyone needs some, uh, some energy, uh, we're going to talk about kickoff. So how does your guys' team approach kickoff? And what does your team do that you think results in a more successful season compared to other teams? Yeah, um, so I'll take this. I do a lot of our, you know, kind of lead a lot of our kickoff process. Um, I think we follow a fairly similar approach to a lot of teams. Um, you know, most of what we do has actually been stolen from other teams throughout the years. So uh, it's nothing, I would say, truly innovative. You know, it's been an iterative process to kind of hone it in and, and make it a little bit more our own. Um, find out what works best with our team compared to, you know, some of the other teams I've worked with. Uh, but in general, you know, it starts kind of uh, the same way a lot of FRC teams start. You know, we do a very thorough reading of the rules. On our team, we break into small groups and each person reads a rule out loud. And then, you know, the next person reads the next rule and the next person reads the next rule. And that, at you know, at a minimum, make sure that every student who's participating in the kickoff process has at least heard every rule. Now, it doesn't mean they understand it necessarily. It doesn't mean they care about that rule necessarily, but at least they've heard it. So, um, you know, maybe through some supplemental seepage, they, you know, now understand every rule. Uh, the next thing we do is we kind of brainstorm all the possible robot actions in a game. So, you know, if it's legal to do it, we do it, you know, we put it up on this list um, and, this list is really kind of our first chance to get really into the brainstorming process for the season. So um, this is where a lot of the out of, out of the box ideas come into play. Uh, this is actually something I stole from uh, Rahul Yarlagata, who used to be a 469 mentor, or he was a student on 469. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was never, I guess he didn't mentor there, but uh, we mentored together on 5188 and he, uh, you know, showed me this part and I really like it. I think this is a, a great opportunity to really, you know, try to stretch the limits of the game, see what's explicitly allowed and what's explicitly disallowed, uh, and then get that up on the board in front of everybody. Um, after that, we kind of take those actions and lump them into some smaller, what we call robot archetypes. Um, so these are just, you know, standard robots you think you'll see at a competition, high goal shooter, um, you know, defense crosser in 2016. That's in my head. We just did a mock kickoff <laughs> on Saturday. So, um, you know, lots of, um, you know, and we come up with a fair number of those and, and we really put those then into our kind of game simulation process. So the game simulation, um, Tyler, if you want to go back to that spreadsheet yeah. you showed, uh, it's actually on the second sheet of that spreadsheet is kind of how we do our game simulations. Um, and really this is just kind of trying to get an idea of what a general game will look like given any uh, combination of robot archetypes. And so we'll walk through Kind of a second by second breakdown of what a robot could do in a match and they're not going to be a hundred percent accurate we know that you know we might overestimate or underestimate certain cycle times but what it really lets us do is kind of I compare different action sets to each other and starts letting us identify high value per resource actions uh, and that's kind of the goal of the whole you know strategy part of the kickoff process for us is identify you know what actions or cap robot capabilities uh, can we put on our robot for the least amount of resources that generate the most uh, value towards our team goals? So, you know, our team goals generally involve seeding high at competitions and then winning those events. Um, what actions are letting us seed high and letting us win matches? Um, 
after we kind of go through several rounds of game simulations, we spend anywhere from two to four hours doing that on kickoff weekend. Uh, it kind of depends a little bit on the game and a little bit on how complicated it is and how many different robot archetypes we think uh, could be real front runners in the, in the you know, value proposition for us. Uh, but then we'll move on to a kind of high level strategy discussion where we'll talk about, you know, from a 10,000 feet perspective, what strategy do we think is going to drive success for us the most? And through that, we'll start kind of honing in closer and closer on specific robot actions that we think are uh, necessary or highly valuable. And we'll go through and prioritize that whole list before from top to bottom. So we'll have, you know, obviously drive forward and backwards will always be at the top of the list. Um, and then, you know, we'll go all the way down through, uh, like this past year, one of the kind of lower priority items that ended up, you know, on the feasibility list was um, floor pickup for hatch panels. Uh, it ended up not making the robot, but it was on our priority list. Um, then after that is really when we get into the specific mechanism brainstorming. That's an iterative process, you know, come up with a, you know, exhaustive list of possibilities, compare it down, and then, um, you know, usually we'll come out of our, our brainstorming and, and mechanism pair down with a, two or three um, really plausible mechanisms that we can start then prototyping and comparing to each other. And then, you know, then the work starts on um, actual getting into, you know, robot architecture design and things like that after that. Awesome. And that's where I consider the kickoff process to kind of have ended. Right. We're happy to talk about a new sponsor of fun uh, that I've been a fan of in Michigan for a while. We've been around them a bunch. So Tyler, why don't you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I can't wait to talk about a course of your part of the couple thousand people that are in our Discord now. You should know uh, that we are beyond excited uh, to bring uh, on, on to fun as fun is starting to grow and to help us accomplish our mission. Uh, producing content that is loud, live, and independent. Our friends at Stryker have stepped up to the plate, and, well, guess what? Stryker wants first alumni and mentors who are ready for a career with a cutting-edge medical technology company who have a passion to enable and save lives. Uh, get this. Not only does Stryker pay top dollar for careers, I'm still waiting for my call, by the way, uh, they also pay great on internships and co-ops, but Stryker recognizes the power of first mentors and volunteers and will actively support you in FIRST. Now, I don't know about the, the few of you that are lucky, those who are have jobs right now, but really how many of you can say that your employer actively understands what you do in first? Because as much as I love where I work, uh, it, they don't truly right now. Trying to explain what we do and what fun is, uh, that's a hard thing to get. And Stryker really does understand that. So give Stryker a thought and check out uh, what they have in store. Go to stryker.com uh, to find out more about Stryker uh, and see if there's a high paying first supporting career internship or co-op for you that's s-t-r-y-k-e-r dot com uh and thanks to striker by the way uh for helping uh keep fun loud live and independent uh guys you guys have been awesome stepping up with uh, donations and bits uh, and we're looking at getting to the next level we want to create more and more content for you and can't wait to do so so thanks a lot to striker for stepping up and helping uh let us do things like you know go to more competitions uh actually take a salary for once things like that would be nice and appreciated so thank you striker go check them out s-t-r-y-k-e-r.com um, so, so then kind of, you know, moving past once the robots been made, once you're at the events, um, a hot button issue that everyone always wants to know about is scouting. So how does your team, um, approach scouting? What do you guys do at the events? What are you collecting? How do you collect it? And, and how are you utilizing that information that you guys gather? All right. Well, I'll start off with the first part of that question. Um, so for the 2019 season, we use paper scouting, um, but we are trans uh, transferring to app scouting this season and we tested that out at Chessy Champs. Um, regardless of how we're recording the data though, we have one scout per robot um, recording you know, basic uh, robot performance, um, defense, rating, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the app exports that as a QR code, all of the data goes into a database and then we display all of that on a custom web page. That um, And on that web page, we have a couple different views we can see this one's a team specific team view and then we also have a view for all of the teams that are in a match um as far as pit scouting goes last year we were using a google form 
This year we're planning on using a custom pit scouting website um, and we just collect basic you know, robot capabilities, programming language, drivetrain type, um, photos of the robots. Uh, kind of stuff. Clint, you want to talk about the rest of that question? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the second part of that question was, you know, how do we use that data? And, you know, because we've kind of created this system from scratch, we've been able to build that website back end uh, to be useful in, you know, the ways we need it. And one of the, there's two main times we use it, right? It's in match strategy creation and then alliance, uh, like alliance selection. For the app strategy or match strategy stuff, um, you know, it really it comes down to us looking at our partner's capabilities and our opponent's capabilities and really looking to try to find an expected outcome, right? If we look like we're going to get our butts kicked by, you know, 300 points, uh, then we'll really switch over to trying to maximize those bonus RPs if we can and tiebreakers. So it, the data comes in really handy there because we can see, okay, our opponents are, you know, averaging whatever, 14 cargo a match, you know, us defended with our partners, maybe we can get 12 in um, and that's optimistic. It doesn't look like we're going to win this match. So let's look at, you know, how can we maximize our ability to complete the rocket and get the HAB ranking point, right? Uh, really just trying to go into every match with as high expected value of our piece as we can. So if it looks like we can fight it out for the win, we'll obviously go for that. Um, but if it looks like the win's out of reach, we'll really use that data then to try to maximize the ranking score. Um, as far as alliance selection go, it really depends a lot on what the situation is. You know, a lot of times, I won't say a lot of times, but you know, if we find ourselves kind of in, you know, fighting for the top spot, it looks like we're gonna be able to take the number one seat. Then we, you know, use the data to look for a complementary robot, one that can, um, you know, this year take the other half of the field while we get, you know, owned by defense. And then for our second pick, we'll look for somebody who can go and play defense on the other side of the field, and we use the data for that. If we're not in the top spot and it looks like, you know, we may get picked by another team, then we'll use the data to decide whether or not it seems valuable to decline. And if it does, we'll do that and, you know, choose our own path. Or if it looks like, you know, accepting the invitation is going to be the best bet, then we'll do that. Um, once we get into the LMs, we kind of switch, uh, you know, our scouting method up and we go to more of a pure paper scouting system. So really, we're looking at it from an alliance perspective at that point. So we scout all of the robots on all of the alliances, but what gets delivered is an alliance specific summary sheet. And that summary sheet usually gets run straight down to me. Uh, who then works with our our drive team and our you know alliance partners to develop the match strategy for that particular match. Um, that's a you know that's a trick we learned from 195 at IRI in 2017. We were just taking notes kind of before that and relaying it via Slack, but actually physically getting the paper in with the data has been really helpful since then. So uh, that's been uh, something that's really helped us out. Awesome. And then the last question before we uh, do our drawing for our first giveaway. So a nice reminder to everybody, if you want a chance to win that giveaway, make sure you put Diet Coke into the chat as our keyword and make sure you have clicked that follow button in the top right. Uh, but our last question before we get to that drawing, um, what would you guys attribute most to your team really finding all the success you've had um, with winning events and, and all, everything that comes with that kind of from 2015 onward? since the team's been around since 2005, and a lot of that success has come in the last, you know, five or six years. All right, yeah, I'll take that question as well. Uh, I've been around very slightly longer, well, not even longer than Chelsea. Chelsea was here when I got here, but um, yeah, the team was, you know, has been around for a long time. Really, the switch came when there was kind of a whole mindset switch into becoming more competitive. And um, I think several members of the team attribute that to a uh, new mentor joining Mike, our drive coach, for the last four years. Uh, he joined the team at the end of the 20, like after the 2013 season, and kind of brought his competitive spirit with him to the team. And that seeped into all the other mentors and students on the team, I think. And uh, really, they made an effort to, and he brought in some new information as well to help help out, you know, with competitiveness and stuff like that. But um, that change over to wanting to win events and wanting to, you know, be competitive at the World Championship really was a big driver in a lot of the changes that followed. Um, 2014, that next season, was the first year that the team ever attended multiple regionals. Um, 
they attended Utah and Colorado. And since then, the team has been attending at least two regionals every year. And that was also the first year that the team built a practice spot, um, which obviously has helped out immensely. Um, Chelsea kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, in 2015, at the end of 2015, the team also took over some new space. It's just over 6,000 square feet of dedicated FRC wow. and FTC space. Um, and so that was a huge driver in team success. You know, it gave us the ability to build a full practice field. It let us bring all of our, uh, well, most of our fab in, in-house. Uh, you know, it enabled us to have every sub team in their own kind of dedicated workspace. And then also allowed us to grow the size of the team, as Chelsea said earlier. Um, you know, if you would have tried to have, you know, a 90 student team in the space we were working out of er earlier, it would not have worked out so well. Um, so that's been that's been a huge help, and and really being able to kind of build that facility out how we wanted it was was pretty great as well. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live and independent.